Big day is finally here. It's a happy day for a lot of Cincinnati Bengal fans. We're talking about the 2020 NFL Draft. We have one of them right here in this Zoom conference. Jason Boris and Emma McCall are here. We're all with the Times News. And big day for Jason. Obviously, we kept talking about your mock draft all, all week. And it's something you've probably been working on for a majority of the year. So you finally submitted your mock draft. 1 a.m. deadline it was. How are you feeling? Justin and Emma, it's good to be on with you guys again. I am so glad that this process is over. Uh, it has been a very stressful, taxing last couple of days. Uh, even as the deadline approached last night, there was buzz, rumors, smoke screens galore. I literally was changing picks on my mock draft minutes before submission. It's just the days here, I can put the pencil down and I can finally enjoy this thing like a fan. There you go, very nice. And uh, Jason, uh, tell everybody how long you've been doing this and how long you've been uh, submitting your picks to the huddle report. And, it, and actually tell everybody what the huddle report is. Yeah, so I've been, involved with the draft process since I was very young, probably back in elementary school, uh, took a passion to the draft, to the whole process, to the event itself. And, and back then it wasn't a mainstream event at all. Uh, it was done on weekdays in the afternoons, 12 rounds. And I used to skip out of school back when I was in fourth, fifth grade to, to watch this event that I thought was really cool. So that's how I kind of got into it. And I started uh, crossing off players, uh, making draft boards, uh, eventually making mock drafts. And it kind of just ballooned from there and, and took off. Really, it started as a hobby for me. Uh, and it's kind of grown into to what it is today uh, with, with some national attention. Uh, then I started obviously publishing it when I started working for you guys, the Times News. Uh, and I've it's about 20 years ago. This is, I believe, my 20th edition of a mock draft that has been published in the Times News. Nice. So, um, as far as the huddle report goes, um, that is the gold standard for grading mock drafts on the internet. Uh, it's a selective process, so not everybody can just throw their mock draft up there. Uh, you have to be um, <clears throat> uh, an acknowledged uh, draft expert or run a draft website or uh, work with the media in some fashion. Uh, so I got involved with them about nine or 10 years ago. Uh, they've been scoring my mock um, for a couple of years. I was the top ranked mock drafter in the entire world, according to them. Uh, I've since fallen off a little bit, um, but I'm still in the top five. So that, that's still a good place to be. Top mock drafter in the entire world. That's a pretty nice title there, Jason. It's a, it's a nice title, and I'm very humbled with that. Uh, but with it comes a heck of a lot of stress. You know, and it's got to be nice. Obviously, you know, we're all in the sports world. We all love competition, whether you're doing mocks or our, our playing days of sports are over. And that's a pretty low blow to myself, considering I'm probably – 30 years younger than Emmett and 10, 15 years younger than Boris, but I rely on fantasy sports and sports betting to, to feel alive and feel that competition again. So it's got to be awesome going toe to toe with guys like Evan Silva from Roto World and just knowing you have a ton of major market competition and you go punch for punch with them pretty much every year, Jason. Yeah. And I have nowhere near the sources that those people do. Um, my mock drafts are compiled um, with very limited resources uh, and a lot of just what's up here. So that's kind of my game plan going in. I, I, with that being said, I do a heck of a lot of research. Um, and basically I've kind of, <clears throat> I've kind of been able to decipher what's real and what's a smoke screen and team um, trends and stuff. So that's how I kind of put things together. Should we dive into it? I'm sure everybody is super excited for tonight, and uh, I can pull up your mock right here, and we can start wherever you'd like. Just give me one second here. Well, the first two are kind of a gimme, Jason. So, um, you know, you got Burroughs, you got Chase Young, one, two, but 
let's uh, let's go past that. Let's uh, let's see where the, the the real draft starts, as you had said the other day on uh, pick three. Yeah, uh, and I just want to real note real quick, uh, being a Bengals fan, I'm kind of sporting my team colors here uh, with the number nine Joe Burrow jersey. So around uh, 8, 10, 8, 15 tonight, we will have our next franchise quarterback. Super excited about that. I, I don't know who you're kidding, but that's a Carson Palmer jersey. <laughs> yeah, that's just because I told you before we went live that it was a Carson Palmer jersey. But it's still number nine, so uh, makes makes good for Zoom viewing um Burrow one Chase Young two uh the Detroit Lions will be on the clock at number three and really that's where the draft starts um th this draft has been like none other um for not only for me but I think for anybody trying to do a mock draft this COVID-19 pandemic has really changed the entire structure of how you get news and how you get information. Uh, and as I said to people before, the information just isn't out there. Um, the buzz, the a lot of times you get this information when scouts go to pro days and scouts talk to other scouts and eventually it makes its way uh, somewhere online and that just wasn't there this year. So uh, this whole mock draft is organized chaos and a complete guessing game, not only for me, but probably for every other mock draft expert and media personality out there. So at Detroit, I didn't want to get too fancy with this pick. Um, even though I'm not 100% sold it's going to be Akuda. Uh, Akuda is absolutely their biggest need. As I said, I'm a little hesitant to put a cornerback at number three just because they aren't taking that high typically. Uh, there was a rumor very late last night that Miami is actually working a trade to come up to number three. Now, whether that's for a quarterback or not, we don't know. There's some buzz they could be coming up for an offensive tackle. Uh, Listen, Miami is such the wild card in this draft, and they literally, as I said to it somewhere, they've they've caused me, I think, to to lose so much, so many uh, years off my life because uh, I just don't know where to go with them. So yeah. they have three, they have three first round picks. You actually, in your mock, have them trading up to get a fourth first round pick. Um, <sighs> So that that just right there, where do you take your quarterback? Where do you take your offensive lineman? You know, that, that's got to be pretty tough right there, just figuring out the Dolphins. Yeah, well, let's talk about Miami because really they are the key player in this draft. Um, if they trade up to number three, they're going to lose draft resources, and they may not be able to trade back up again into the first round. My general thought was if they trade up to three, it has to be for a quarterback, right? I don't think you yeah, I, for Chuck. I can't I don't see think... them trading up for an offensive lineman. If there's a lot of offensive right. linemen. You have six tackles taken in the first round. You would think they wouldn't go up that far for an offensive lineman. Jake. Well, if they if they go up, like I said, two has been connected to this team for well over a year now. They've it's been their game plan for the last 356 days, the tank for two is mantra. Um, and listen, if it wasn't for that injury, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, he would be Miami's guy, if not Cincinnati's guy. Although I still think Burrow would have been the pick. Um, if as you can see, I did have them trading them back up to number 10 because there is buzz that they could be looking at an offensive tackle such as uh, uh, George's left tackle, Andrew Thomas. Um, <clears throat> now, if they did that, basically they're basically saying that Tua is not their guy and they're going to draft a Jordan Love or a Justin Herbert somewhere later on in the first round. So what I did is I just hedged my bets. I don't know what's going to happen. I think the Dolphins' first pick will be one of either Andrew Thomas or Tua. Um, so I picked both. I think, it's, <laughs> I think it's entirely possible at this point that Tua is both Miami and the Chargers guy. And I think Miami might be worried that the Chargers might try to leap over them 
with all these phone calls supposedly pouring into number three, and you got to figure Dave Gettleman's even getting some calls at four. Um, Here's what I can tell you, Justin. I know this for a fact that Cincinnati has been getting a lot of calls from Miami wanting to move up to the number one pick. So what that tells me is that they're placing an insane amount of value in Joe Burrow. I've also heard that the reason they want to try to trade up to three and then keep the number five pick is so they can package three and five to the Bengals in a more enticing offer to get Cincinnati's number one pick. Wow, I think the entire country would explode I don't if think, that happened. I don't think the yeah. Bengals will do that. Maybe. But that's, that's what the Dolphins are, 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 are doing right now. They're, they're leveraging this board or trying to leverage this board. You know, a year ago, guys, Emmett, and then I'll pass it over to you real quick. Everybody was like, what is Miami doing liquidating all of their current, you know, their roster? But now they're yeah. looking like, you know, they're looking like draft day. Uh, well, who was in that movie? Kevin Costner or whatever? Like the, the movie yeah. with Browns or Kevin Bacon, whatever. I don't know. One of the Kevins. Um, so now here's, here's my, yeah, thank you. Here's Miami. Made a lot of veteran offseason signings. Made a lot of interesting moves. And like you said, they have the power right now. They are going to dictate the entire draft tonight, like you said. But, you know, you have a lot of projected trades. And before we go on, just real quick, kind of tell everyone how the scoring works. If you see a couple players later in Jason's draft, too, you're like, well, that doesn't seem like an exact fit. And second of all here, make sure you grab a hard copy of today's paper because Jason's full article is in today's Times News. Yeah, so the way the Huddle Report scores <clears throat> mock drafts is you get one point for every player you correctly select in the first round <clears throat> so on a good draft you want to try to hit about 26 or 27 players in the first round and then for every player that is matched to the correct team you get two additional points okay so that was kind of part of my strategy with with putting Tua and Thomas to Miami um, whether a trade happens or not I'm at least trying to cover some bases so a perfect score is 96. What is, uh, what is a good score that will put you in the top five <laughs> overall, you think? My, hi my highest score, um, and I don't have it in front of me, uh, it was either 54 or 56, uh, and that's an extremely good score. Um, usually a pretty good mock draft is in the high 40s. Um, Mid 40s is acceptable, and that's what I always shoot for. Um, I, I like to see at least 45, 46 as, as a floor for, for what I'm shooting for for, for my, my, my mock draft scores. Um, but the Hubble Report also does live scoring. So as picks are taken off on the website tonight, uh, you can kind of see how you're doing compared to everybody else. And uh, I was on the Hubble Report website earlier today, and I think there's uh, 109 of us um, getting scored this year. Wow. Very cool. You know, the more I'm looking at this, and we can move on after this if you'd like, but I'm looking at the Giants at number four, uh, a, guy, a team who's speculated to p potentially take some offensive line help. You know, obviously you have uh, some defensive studs like Isaiah Simmons in conversation there too. I mean, if you're getting an offer to get a couple more assets in a draft, that's pretty deep. Uh, why not move a peg or two down, still get one of the top two linemen on your board? Um, and I, I, I really, you know, Everybody laughs at Dave Gettleman and, you know, this and that. But looking back, Daniel Jones had a decent year and he's shown some potential and everybody thought that was the laugh, laughing stock of the draft world. But I'm, I wouldn't be shocked if the Giants moved down either. And, you know, maybe you see the Chargers leapfrog or Miami even try to secure you know, whoever their quarterback is. Yeah, uh, no doubt. Um, I think depending on what happens at three is going to dictate what's going to happen at four. Right. Uh, Obviously, offensive tackle is being linked to the Giants right now heavily. Um, there was some buzz about Isaiah Simmons. I don't foresee that happening. So I think it's offensive tackle. I just don't know which one. So could Miami possibly be saying, well, um, I have Werfs going to the Dolphins, but could possibly the strategy be that Jedrick Wills – Giants, actually. Yeah, Jedrick Wills was um, floated around as a possible Giants target. Uh, he could also be a Dolphins target. So if the Dolphins are getting scared and Wills is their guy, they might want to hop the Giants. Uh, the thing about Jedrick Wills is he is a right tackle. He was also Tua's blindside protector at Alabama. 
So if you're going to connect the dots, if the Dolphins are going to try those pairs to get, uh, try to put those pair together in the NFL, it does make sense. Well, as if the draft isn't going to be hectic enough. You got Wills and Wirfs, uh, two highly <laughs> yeah. offensive. How about it? Uh, but yeah, it should be interesting towards the top. You know, when pick three is announced from Roger yeah. Goodell's basement. Yeah, right. you know, last thing on the quarterbacks, I have no idea what's going to happen tonight. Um, <laughs> your speculation. Um, uh, Dolphins, Herbert to the Chargers. I wouldn't be surprised if it's Herbert to the Dolphins, Tua to the Chargers. I wouldn't be surprised if Miami takes a tackle first and goes and takes Jordan Love at number 18 later on. Nothing will surprise the quarterbacks right now. Wow. Just moving on a little now, um, Jason, you have four offensive linemen taken in the first 11 picks of the draft. So let's talk about the order, um, you know, afterwards, after the after Worfs goes number four, as you're projecting. Um, talk about the next group of offensive tackles and why you like them to each specific team. Yeah, there's a consensus top four. Uh, the problem is that out of those four, there's probably a different top guy on every other team's draft board, um, depending on what you're looking for. So Becton and Andrew Thomas are purely left tackles, okay? Wirfs and Wills played right tackle last year, um, but can possibly swing to left. So for a team like uh, Cleveland, um, who is looking for a right tack or a left tackle, I'm sorry, um, they're obviously going to be looking for um, a Becton or, or a Thomas. And I was very close to mocking Andrew Thomas to the Browns. Um, but you have to remember that the Trent Williams cloud is hovering over all of our heads as well. Um, and Cleveland is being heavily connected to him. So um, if they're feeling confident that they could land Trent Williams sometime in the next few days, they may not prioritize a tackle, which could open up a team like Tampa Bay who wants one to kind of come up for one. Or as I have in my mock draft, possibly Miami trading back up into the top 10. On the other side of the coin here, a team that's been publicly aggressive in trying to trade up to get some defensive help is Atlanta. Uh, and you have a projected trade at number nine here. Derek Brown, a guy who is kind of all over the place on a bunch of people's different mocks and projections here. But Atlanta in a division, like I said, that now has Tom Brady, Gronk, and Drew Brees, uh, and they lost Vic Beasley. You got to think they're going to target somebody up front there uh, for the Falcons. Wouldn't surprise me if Derek Brown's the pick at number three. Uh, I think what the Falcons are doing here is I think their preference is to try to get up for Brown or Akuda. So whichever person the Lions don't take, I think you may see Atlanta coming up for one of them too, with the fallback being that if they can't get up high enough, Javon Kinlaw or CJ Henderson. Very good. And then I have no, I have no then, doubt that the Falcons are trading up tonight. Okay. And then our, our next group of picks, starting with your 12th pick, the Las Vegas Raiders, you have four straight wide receivers going in the, in that group of picks. Talk about those teams and those receivers, Jason. Yeah. As I was texting you last night, um, I had my mock draft penciled out. Um, and I turned on uh, NFL Network looking at Daniel Jeremiah's mock draft, and I had receivers going 12, 13, 14, 15. Lo and behold, Daniel D G DJ had receivers going 12, 13, 14, 15. So um, at least I kind of feel good that I'm in the same ballpark with some of um, the more widely known experts. L listen, Las Vegas, I think, is definitely shooting for a receiver. Las Vegas is interesting now because overnight you've had – You've heard some buzz that they could be working with Jacksonville on a trade for Yannick Ngakwe. Uh, if that happens, they would probably have to give up one of their two first round picks. Um, so I think it'll probably be num number 19 more than 12, but anything's possible. Um, San Francisco, when they traded with DeForest Buckner to get up to uh, the 13th pick where the Colts were, uh, my immediate thought was, yes, they want a receiver. Uh, they since lost Emmanuel Sanders. Uh, Goodwin's on the chopping block, so I, I do think that they're another team looking to address receivers. Denver is another team at 15, whether they stay or whether they trade up. 
Um, I think they're looking for a receiver. And my dark horse was Tampa Bay. You're not going to see a receiver mock to Tampa Bay uh, too often here. Um, listen, if they can get up for an offensive tackle, I think that's the direction they're going to go in. Um, but if those top four are off the board, uh, you still want to get Tom Brady weapons. They have their outside receivers in Evans and uh, Godwin. They have their tight end now with Gronk. What they're really missing is a slot receiver, and I think Justin Jefferson would just fill that and almost make the Tampa Bay offense just unfair. Yeah, that's a, go ahead. That's going to disappoint some Eagles fans, is I was what I was going to say, because uh, most people think the Eagles are going to go with the receiver down low, and to have the top four coming off that high would obviously put them to their next tier of, of receivers, I would think. Yeah, so. Before I put Je – I'll be honest with you guys. Before I put Jefferson um, to Tampa Bay, uh, I did have him going to Philly. Um, that kind of changed over the last couple days uh, just because I think Justin Jefferson may get drafted higher uh, than what people think. So that's why I mocked him to Tampa. Uh, so I could still see the Eagles looking at a receiver, um, possibly even trading down to get their guy. Or, or else linebacker. Uh, there are the two positions that I think that the Eagles are going to come out with on this draft. Wide talk, receiver, a linebacker in the first round. Talk to me about Jerry Judy, a little lower on your board than maybe some. Is there injury concerns, or what's up with Judy? Yeah, so the reason I sent him to the Broncos is because um, there's been some buzz out there that John Elway wants to move up. Um, and, and this is coming from uh, the Denver media, uh, and that Judy is their guy. So I don't have him moving up in this draft. They still could to possibly land him. Um, but if they stay at 15, Judy could possibly fall because over the last week or so, there has been some concerns and red flags raised about uh, a knee condition that, that he's played with. Um, again, when you get this close to the draft, there's red, red flags are prevalent throughout the league. Teams are going to purposely try to throw information out there to get their prospects to fall. Um, so I'm project projecting to be there. Uh, I think Ruggs will be an ideal fit um, for them. So I, I say an Alabama receiver to Denver. Don't really know which one, but if they do trade up. Uh, and I, I've been doing a couple of uh, media appearances with some Denver uh, radio stations over the past couple of days. Uh, I also won't discount the idea of them trading up for an offensive tackle. Uh, their line can still use some work. Uh, and I think Garrett Bowles is kind of on his last hurrah there in Denver. C.J. Henderson, popular name, great corner. You like the Jaguars landed him here. Is that the is that from the Atlanta trade? Yeah. So C.J. Henderson, talk to me about your boy here. I know I know you're pretty high on him in general. Yeah, you can easily go in the top ten, Justin. Um, uh, he, I, if Jacksonville stays at number nine, I think Jacksonville can take him there. Uh, they they need holes all over. Uh, they lost A.J. Boye. This past offseason, they lost Jalen Ramsey last offseason. Um, so it's kind of funny. As you'll see what I did at 20, I, I kind of hedged again, similar to what I did with the Dolphins, where if they stay at nine, I think the pick's going to be between Kinlaw and Henderson. So uh, I said, well, why not give them both? And to be honest with you, I can see Kinlaw falling. He's another one that has had low, some lower body red flags from injuries in college with his hips and his knees. Um so, like I said in my write-up, similar to Juwan Taylor last year, everybody pegged him in the top seven to ten, and he fell out of the first round. Don't think it's going to be that drastic of a fall um, for 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 Kinlaw, but it wouldn't surprise me if he slips to sixteen through twenty this uh, tonight. So, so how about now we hop to twenty-one, cop over a few picks, and get to the Eagles, so you have a little time to talk about the Eagles pick, uh, Jason. You're one of the, you're probably the only one I've seen make this projection for the Eagles. Tell me where you're getting this info from. Well, I, I haven't gotten the info really from, from anybody. <laughs> uh, so just to give you guys a little background and how I structure my mock drafts, um, I kind of work from the back to the front. Um, I basically go and I try to pick who my top 32 players are going to be, okay? Because that's almost more important for me is to try to get more people slotted into the first round than it is to actually match them to teams. Um, because trying to match them to, to, to teams is just a very difficult process. 
the first trade and it's a domino effect and it blows your entire mock draft up. So I always like to say, I like to try to get those top 32, as many of them in the first round as possible. And I think Brandon Ayuk is a first round player. Um, in my mind, he's the fifth receiver in this draft. With that being said, if the top four go ahead of where the Eagles are picking, then the next receiver on my board is Ayuk. So that's where I sent him. I sent him to Philly. Um, I did find an interesting interview with him online uh, that he was talking to someone and a comment that he made was that there is an extremely huge chance that by the end of Thursday night, he will be a Philadelphia Eagle. So that's straight from the player's mouth. So if the player's that confident, um, and I was going to give the Eagles a receiver anyway. Um, I just figured I'd make that connection. Um, he is a good player. Uh, he, he wasn't highly known in Arizona State. Uh, he just did have a core um, <clears throat> injury that he got repaired. He should be fine. Um, but he's an explosive, talented player. Uh, he excels at yards after the catch. Um, he could be a great replacement for DJAX if, if this is Deshaun's last year. Well, if that's the case, we'll be blessed to have about three months of Philly Sports Talk Radio. People calling, <laughs> who is this? Oh, you guy. Why didn't they trade up and get C.D. Lamb? What about Justin Jefferson? Boy, I can't wait for that. Looks like I'll be driving in silence in my car for the football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, don't, listen, don't, listen, don't be surprised if a linebacker is the pick either. Um, I was very, very close to, to keeping Patrick Queen there. Um, but I did not. I pulled the trigger yeah. wide out. Talk about that, Jason. Um, you actually have both what Murray and Queen going a couple picks later, twenty third and twenty fourth in your mock. They're the the um, the two linebackers that the Eagles would take <laughs> if they skipped a receiver. So listen, when you get this late in in a mock draft, um, you know, trying to figure the order where these players are, are going to get selected, it, it's a no-win situation. So you got to look at team needs here and slot the players into team needs. When I look at the linebacker position, I think the two teams in the back half of the first round that can most benefit from that position are the Baltimore Ravens and the New Orleans Saints. All right? So that's where I have the linebackers going. Um <clears throat> I just think that Baltimore has never replaced C.J. Mosley. I think they're looking for defense with this pick. Um, if they go offense, I really like center Cesar Ruiz from Michigan um, to kind of help uh, the run game there in Baltimore as if it's not already good enough. Um, but to me, I think Murray fits more with what Baltimore is doing, and I think Queen fits more with what New Orleans is doing. So that's why I went with them there. I think just looking at your draft here, Jalen Johnson, a name that's kind of been trending upwards. I like him a lot. But if Miami can really land McKinney at 26, I think that would be a huge steal for them. And if they get their guy in the front part of the draft, that, I think Miami would be an instant winner in 2020 of, this, of the draft. Yeah, so again, like I said, if they move up to get a tackle or a quarterback, this pick becomes null and void because they're probably going to have to ship it off to another team. But, again, Xavier McKinney, I think he's a first-round talent. You look uh, what teams are really in the back end that need safeties. There's not a whole lot of them. So, I, for me, this was between McKinney and Antoine Winfield, um, and I went with McKinney as a replacement for Minka Fitzpatrick. I see. And, and quarterbacks – go ahead, Justin. No, I was going to say, I see some Jordan Love here, Emmett. At yeah, that's where I was going, too. Quarterbacks are the sexy pick in, in all – drafts every team wants their every fan base wants their team to get the next Tom Brady you know some sleeper in the draft and uh, we're late first round now and you have a fourth quarterback coming up here Jason talk about it so with the fourth quarter the thing with the quarterbacks is look at this draft there's not a lot of teams that need them Miami San Diego New England Indianapolis, possibly Jacksonville, although I think Jacksonville's strategy is to basically uh, tank for Trevor, uh, Trevor Lawrence from Clemson for, for next year's draft. So I can see them going quarterback here. But the thing with when you get this late, um, you now have to start considering the fifth-year team option on contracts. And that is especially important for the quarterback position that is such that has such a high contract to begin with. 
So uh, I think Love will get selected at some point. It's just trying to pick a team. Now, listen, Indianapolis, they're not even scheduled to pick in the first round. But what I do know is that Seattle has traded down or out of the first round in the last eight drafts. Indianapolis has two early second round picks. So possibly they can ship one of those picks to Seattle. Seattle moves down a few picks, not a lot. They get some more draft capital along the way. Um, Rivers is only signed to a one-year contract out there. Um, so again, it, to me, it makes sense. Not saying it's going to happen, um, but I'm just playing uh, the logic card. Makes sense. You know, Indianapolis might have the best backup quarterback in football now, Jacoby Brissett. Um, wasn't, wasn't horrible. Wasn't horrible. I, I'm not shocked they went and got Rivers. Um, but I think, you know, one-year deal, not a lot of risk there for the Colts. And Jordan Love, it's going to be interesting to see. We'll know sooner than later, you know, what Bill Belichick's plan is with Jared Stidham. Maybe this will be one of the first hints that are dropping soon. Of course, guys like Cam Newton still don't have a home. And Jameis Winston, uh, for those of you who didn't catch our, our video earlier this week, you know, the COVID crisis and the free agent dominoes that haven't fell yet either um, really throw one more additional wrench into mock drafting as if there aren't enough already. Very true. Uh, no doubt. Last couple picks here, Emmett. So, well, let's yeah, talk we, about New England really quick. Um, don't see them going quarterback here. Um, again, I, I, I don't know where they're going. I, I, I would think defense. Um, Epineza, great fit with uh, the scheme that Belichick runs. I could also see this as a possible Xavier McKinney spot um, if he's still on the board. But Emmett, as a Notre Dame fan, I was so close, so close. Cole Komet? Komet. He's for a New perfect England. fit for New England. I, I saw you had mentioned that in your New England pick, that he was, a, he was an option and uh, he, he could be Gronk too. So, uh, you, you have no idea how close I was. So if we're watching tonight and you see Komet to the Patriots, I'll probably be kicking myself. That would be that would be nice for Notre Dame fans to see him get taken there. So I, I hope you're wrong with your pick and right with your almost. <laughs> Jason, one more for you. One more for you. We're running a little on time. DeAndre Swift, we got to talk about a running back, and then we'll wrap things up. I, I'm, I'm not certain that a running back is even going to be drafted in the first round. Um, but what we do know is that Miami need one needs one badly. Uh, their leading rusher last year was Ryan Fitzpatrick, the quarterback. <laughs> now, again, this That's, is all going to depend. The 40-year-old quarterback. Yeah. If Miami doesn't trade up at all, they possibly could trade back into the first round to possibly take a running back. Uh, there is some buzz. The Kansas City is looking at Swift. Uh, Detroit picks early in the second round. They're projected to go a running back. So if Miami really is targeting a running back, and I put Swift in here just because I think he's a first-round caliber player. I'm not sure if the other ones are. So, again, it's just a, t a team fit. Listen, I, I doubt Miami's going to make four first-round picks in this draft like I have in my mock. Um, if, they can, if I can land two of those four players, I'll be happy. Um, but if they wait, uh, a guy I hear they really like, too, is J.K. Dobbins. So um, just so many variables this year. Jason, is Leonard Fournette a name we could see on the move tonight? A lot of rumors, you know, we just talked about tanking for the next best thing next year. And I don't think you're going to get uh, – Let's like, how should I put this? Fournette's value is as high as it's going to be right now on draft day. He's healthy and people are trying to be aggressive. Um, tonight might be the night for maybe a Fournette move. We heard the Chiefs might be looking for a running back. You know, Detroit with Kerryon Johnson, who knows what. You know, six or seven different teams have been thrown in the Leonard Fournette kind of uh, building fire here. Yeah, I like Fournette to Detroit. Um, I, whether it happens tonight, I, I don't think so. Um, but, again, I don't think you're going to get a high pick for him. Right. Uh, I think best-case scenario, you're looking at a mid-round pick. Um, Best case, third round, probably more in the fourth round range. Um, so it could happen. I, I think you'd, if you're going to see a Jaguar player go tonight, it's going to be in Gawkway. You know, Emmett, Oakland could have just kept Khalil Mack a couple years ago and uh, they wouldn't have this problem at all. But Emmett, exactly. I, 
Emmett, what, what are your, you know, closing thoughts on Jason's mock and just the draft coming up tonight? Yeah, um, I, I just did a little quick recap here of, of Jason's mock. Seven offensive linemen, six defensive backs, five wide receivers. Um, they were the, they're the loaded positions in this draft, and they're also the positions where teams seem to have the most need. So I, I think it's a, a pretty good matchup that way. Um, and it just uh, looking at the team picks, we have uh, five from Alabama, four from LSU, and 14 from the SEC. And that could be important because I've seen several prop bets for the draft where it's like over under 14 and a half for SEC players in the first round. So if we go by Jason's draft mock here, then we're going under with that. Speaking of any props, uh, I, I don't play any. Um, I'm not, but I, Justin, I hear you're doing some. Uh, is there any that uh, we wrap this up that, that you're curious on? Well, I think Tua is, is interesting. Um, I'm, I'll probably be texting you at the draft and eating my words, but I, I'm a believer. I, I think a real interesting line is uh, five and a half where Tua is going to be drafted. I, I like the under, I, I think. He'll be four or five uh, for sure. Uh, we'll see about that. I, you know, I, I like the under there too. I'm glad to hear that. It, it just makes it sense so. to me that Tua is both the Chargers and Miami's guy. Uh, you definitely sold me when you reminded me that, hey, in the offseason, the Chargers shirt up that right side of that line, which is indeed Tua's blind side. So I really do think that Tua is the guy for both of these teams. And um, the fact that Detroit's fielding some calls, and I do believe that it could be both of these teams checking in to kind of solidify that they can get their guy. Uh, I think you could definitely see Detroit on the move. Um, you know, uh, you got Wirfs, a uh, big offensive lineman. Uh, you have him mocked going to the Giants at four. He is uh, seven and a half. I took the under on that too. Um, I think. And, but if he doesn't go to the Giants, um, he's going to slide. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the risk, risk you're willing to take. <laughs> uh, the, another, one more I had listed here um, that is interesting. Now, it depends on what happens with Ngakwe is there is a prop that uh, Las Vegas first selection will be a wide receiver. Will that come in the first round? I don't know. If they give up both of those first round picks, will they still go after a receiver later in the draft? Like you said, Jason, it is historically one of the deepest receiver drafts in history. Yeah, they're not going to give up both I think they're more likely to give up number 19 uh, than 12 uh, so at 12 it's either it's got to be it's got to be cornerback or wide receiver uh, with my lean towards wide receiver uh, the last thing to it though with with the Chargers and I said this in my in my write-up if he goes to Los Angeles with that Samoan population and Polynesian influence there so close to Hawaii I think there's like I forget the exact numbers, but 70,000 Samoans just in Los Angeles County alone, he would be an absolute rock star for a team that got new uniforms. It was, the uniforms are really cool, by the way, if you haven't seen them. A new stadium. They're competing with the Rams for the market. I mean, absolute rock star. For sure. For sure. For a team that, you know, plays in such a big stadium and has trouble filling the seats, you lose Phillip Rivers. I think that's another team where I just can't see them saying, we're going to give Tyrod Taylor a shot. He's 31. He's had shots. You know, if they thought the consistency and the upside was there, he wouldn't be a 31-year-old journeyman backup quarterback either. So. Here's, one, here's one more thing, though. Like, you're talking about – so, Tua played in an offense that has two first-round receivers this year – Possibly two first-round receivers next year in Jalen Waddle and Devontae um, – uh, uh, I forget his last name. Devontae um, – I can't help you. I, yeah, I, I, it's, I'm losing his name. But, again, he's a first-round player next year. Um, Tua has been surrounded by weapons. Oregon hasn't had a receiver this year. I think their top receiver was, like, at 500 yards. Um what would happen if you put Justin Herbert in Alabama's offense? Would we be talking about these prospects in a different tone? Possibly. Really good point. 
Good point. What about the level of competition in the pack opposed to the SEC, though? Yeah, that's, uh, a, that's a good point as well. That's true. I can play devil's advocate, too. But yeah. you're, Listen, you're two, two, two is short, two is left-handed, two has injuries. All right? There's three red flags right there. Herbert has all of the physical tools that you're looking for, um, but he really hasn't excelled at the college level, and he's an introvert. So they're just two wow. – Five minutes ago, you had me complain about my under five and a half with two, and now you're like, bang, three. three, (laughs) (laughs) Hold Uh, that down. Well, Jason, what are your final thoughts? Let's let's get out of here. You probably need a power nap before the big night tonight. Um, tonight will be organized chaos. Okay, Uh, everybody's going to be watching this thing because there's no sports on TV. There hasn't been in weeks. Um, everybody's going to tune in to watching a virtual Zoom session amongst everybody in the NFL. Um, like I said on our uh, Zoom session on Sunday night, I'm interested to see how this is going to be produced more than anything. Um, I think, you know, I think there's prop bets, like how many dogs make their uh, way on camera tonight at these people's houses or how many how many um, wives or um, kids walk in the, the, the path of the camera. So it, it's really going to be exciting. Um, you know, the, the hard work's done. You know, put the pencils down. You don't have to, to, to research like Matt anymore. Now it's just enjoying the process. Uh, I think mock scores are going to be low this year. I, I'm not going to say that I have super high expectations just because of the difficulty uh, that it was this year to come up with a, a first-round mock draft. And I think anybody you talk to that does them will say the same exact thing. So, uh, you know, it's out of my hands now. I'm just going to sit back as a fan, uh, watch it, and enjoy it. Emmett, anything else before we get out of here? No, no. Sounds like a good plan. Looking forward to some some actual live sporting events on TV um, tonight. So, yep, just going to do the same thing. All right. Well, definitely grab Thursday's edition of the Times News. Check out the hard copy print of Jason Boris 2020 mock draft. You have any good story ideas, anything going up in the community, feel free to email Emmett McCall or the sports department. Obviously, with everything going on, we're looking for feature ideas and uh, we're pretty much open to anything. If you want to talk some sports on a Zoom call, a local Zoom call, you know, we're open to pretty much anything. Right, Emmett? Sounds good, Justin. Yep, exactly. All right, so for Evan McCall, the sports editor at the Times News, and Jason Boris and his 2020 NFL mock draft, good luck tonight, Jason. I'm Justin Carlucci. We'll see you later.